Matthew 24, verses 14 through 25. And the King James text today reads, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Amen. Matthew 24, 14 through 25. Let's go to the Lord right now with another word of prayer. Master, once again, God, we come before you. The word of the Lord is broken for the benefit of God's people. The bread of life is disseminated. Master, you've called men and women to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And Lord, you have placed within our hands the great and awesome responsibility of declaring unto the people of God, Thus saith the Lord. I pray, God, right now, by the anointing and presence and power of the Holy Ghost, that you would touch the lips of your servant, that you would help me to deliver faithfully, adequately, efficiently the Word of God, that the people of God might benefit from it. Lord, today we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our world. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in the church like we've never needed it before. Touch me, O oh God. Help me to deliver this message in a manner that will be effective. A manner, O oh God, that will bring change into the thinking and into the lives of God's people that we might be ready when this hour of great trouble comes upon us. We ask it all today, O oh God, and none other than in the mighty, powerful, wonderful, saving name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today, Be Not Deceived. Amen. Be Not Deceived. The Lord declares that in our primary text today, the Lord declares that things will transpire in the last days which will be so convincing, including supernatural 
powers and events. He said these things will be so convincing that even the very elect, now the elect, when the term elect is used, this generally refers to the nation and the people of Israel. When you see biblical writers refer to the elect, they're generally speaking to the nation and the people of Israel. The closer we come to the end of this age, the more aggressively the enemy of humankind will fight to lay claim on as many souls as he possibly can. There is an important principle that we often overlook, and that principle is this. The closer we come to the outpouring of blessing, the more the enemy is going to fight to prevent us from being in a position to receive that blessing. Did you hear what I just said now? The closer we come to the outpouring of a blessing, meaning the closer we come to God having a blessing scheduled for us, the more the enemy is going to fight to prevent us from being in a position to receive that blessing. In other words, he wants to knock us off track. If he can knock us off track, then we're no longer in a position to receive the blessing. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are people who backslide and they give up on God and they give up on the church and they give up on living for the Lord minutes or hours or days before a blessing has been scheduled to arrive to them. But the enemy knows all I have to do is knock them off track. If I can knock them off track, then they will no longer be in a position to receive that blessing. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He cannot, listen to me, the enemy cannot prevent you from receiving that blessing. But he can cause you to be knocked off track so that you're not in a position any longer to receive it. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? See, a lot of people want to say, oh, this blessing hasn't come because the enemy is in the way. No, 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 honey. When it comes to God's people and the blessing and favor of God, I got news for you. There isn't a devil in hell powerful enough to get in the way. But it's imperative that we stay on track. Hallelujah. It is imperative that we continue to walk as we know we ought to walk so that we might continue to be in a place to receive that blessing when it comes. The principle that I speak of today is often stated as when the Lord starts blessing, the devil comes a-messing. Amen. But the truth is, the devil comes a-messing before the blessing arrives in an effort to prevent us from receiving it to begin with. As Moses drew closer to the promised land, his patience with God's people grew thin. And he wound up disobeying the voice of the Lord out of sheer frustration. And that disobedience cost him the ability to cross into the promised land with those he had been leading for 40 years. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The enemy was able to knock him off track. Hallelujah. And because he got knocked off track, he no longer was in a position to receive the blessing that for 40 years he looked forward to. The Word of God tells us in John chapter 10 and verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I've often experienced in my own life the concept just about the time I completely 
run out of patience and start screaming and hollering in frustration, the Lord comes through in miraculous fashion. And I stand there feeling the fool. Amen. <laughs> oh, I can't count how many times I've been in that position. Had I held out just one more day, I would have seen all would end well. But in my humanity, I could not find the patience or the peace to hold out for yet one more day. And I found myself breaking just as the blessing was at my door. My goodness, I want to tell you folks, the closer we come to the rapture of the church, the harder the enemy is going to work to see to it that you miss the rapture. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The harder the enemy is going to work against the church to see to it that backsliders do not get reclaimed. The harder the enemy is going to work against missionaries to make certain that people around the world never hear this wonderful name Jesus. The harder the enemy is going to work to make certain that people in America hate the church and hate the gospel because of the stupidity and the asininity of those who call themselves Christians. You hear what I'm telling you now? This is all how the enemy works. He knows knows that the rapture is coming. He knows the church will soon be redeemed. He does not know the date or the hour. There's a reason Jesus said no man knoweth the day nor the hour. The Bible speaks of Satan and says that he is so wise and so cunning that there is nothing that can be hid from him. You wonder why Jesus used the language why he said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour, neither the angels in heaven. He said, not even the Son of Man, meaning his humanity, in his humanity. He said, one of the things I left in heaven, when I left heaven, was the knowledge of the day and the hour that I would come, because that day was already set. He said, I left that knowledge in heaven. Because the devil has no access to it there. But the minute I put it in a human mind, guess what? He has access to it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? There is nothing that can be hid from him. Do you hear what I'm telling you? So the enemy, unlike the church, the enemy knows not only how to read the Bible, but he knows how to understand it. I'm going to tell you something. There are people out there today in evangelical and fundamentalist churches being led by a bunch of false prophets and false teachers. And the enemy laughs because while they are preaching a message that is completely contrary to the Word of God, Satan knows good and well what the Word of God really says. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something. The devil's a lot more panicked today about the return of Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church he is much more panicked about this promise of God than the church is why? because he knows how soon it is to come he knows how much time he has left my goodness all the things that he has in store for the last days for the final push he knows how Many of the players are already in place, including the Antichrist. He knows how exactly where the Antichrist is living right now, exactly how old he is, exactly how much he knows. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, so therefore he is pushing against the church like he has never pushed against the church before. Because if he can knock the people of God off track, if he can knock the church off track, then he will put us in a position to not even be able to receive the promise of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? We will not be in a position to receive the promised blessing. We will not be able to receive what God has in store for us. I have not 
not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. And oh, wouldn't it be a shame to miss all that because you allowed the enemy at this hour to knock you off track. Oh, I want to tell you, it saddens me to see the level of deception that is going on in the church world today. God's people are being deceived in mass. They are being deceived by the millions. This is not a small problem. It is a massive problem. This is not something that is affecting the minority. It is something that in fact is affecting the majority. In the Word of God, Matthew 24 and verse 5, I read it again, I read it to you today. The Lord Jesus Christ said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Mark 13, 6, the same morning. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many. Luke 21 verse 8, and he said, take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Oh, children, I want to tell you today. We are living in an hour and in a time of deception. The enemy is deceiving millions and millions of believers. And we had better be in a place today where we are not willing to be deceived. I have over my head today two book covers pictured that I found on the internet. I've, I've seen things posted in recent times concerning these books. One book that is titled President Donald J. Trump, The Son of Man, The Christ. My Lord have mercy. And then another man has written a book, God's Chaos Code. Folks, I've got news for you. God does not work in or through chaos. The word of the Lord declares God is not the author of confusion. That's right. God doesn't work in chaos. God is a God of order and structure. He does not work through chaos. But this is the kind of message that is being sold to the church that Donald J. Trump, one of the most ungodly, wicked, evil, demonic men in human history is indeed the Christ. And there are millions upon millions of Christians who are today believing this foolishness. Oh, children, I want to tell you, I don't know why this thing keeps changing on me. The panel just keeps changing on its own, and I'm not changing it. So I don't know why it keeps changing, but all right. Amen. Interestingly enough, listen to me, children. The spirit of Antichrist is not identified by permissiveness or the preaching of the acceptability of compromised conduct. That's not how the spirit of Antichrist is identified. The spirit of Antichrist is identified, rather, by the acknowledgement of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this truth which will separate the sheep from the goats. And many in the church today 
have been so distracted by the false leaders and false teachers of this age that they are focused entirely on the wrong issues and have left themselves wide open to be deceived in areas that really count and that really matter. In 1 John 4, 1 through 8, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby we know ye know, excuse me, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we, excuse me, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Listen, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. The one thing we see happening in the church world today is the glaring absence of love. More hatred and malice is being broadcast from pulpits today than has ever been broadcast from pulpits before. Whereas at one time, groups that embraced and preached a hateful, condemnatory, loveless message were viewed as the outliers and objectionable, they now have become the majority of evangelical and fundamentalist Christianity. People and certain groups within our population today are preached against and identified as the enemies of society, the enemies of the church, the enemies of our government, and preachers no longer admonish believers to live as the Lord has called us to live and to walk in love toward those who are both in and outside of the church. Church. In Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 12, the word of the Lord declares, Be ye followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. 
Be ye therefore partake, be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Today the church will embrace and defend men who are wicked to the core and who have a reputation for openly embracing a lifestyle that is not at all reflective of faith in God and to walk with Jesus Christ. This is contrary to the instruction we have received from the Word of God. We are to be more discerning than this, not being deceived by false claims of faith, while the actions of the individual make abundantly clear that they, can, that they possess no real confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the public and soul? Be ye therefore perfect, meaning mature, grown, established, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, as well as verse 13. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly laden uh, women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then in verse 13, the, uh, the writer says, Paul said to Timothy, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? This is for those who want to believe universalist theology. You see, there are people out there today who want to tell you that in the end, everybody's going to be saved. There is no distinction. There's no such thing as being born again. There's no such thing as being numbered among the redeemed. There is no such thing as being numbered among the righteous. In the end, all of humanity will be saved. But 
the writer today answers this false doctrine in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, and I'm going to address that in a moment, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Folks, since the beginning of time, there have been many non-believers who would gladly attend church. But this does not mean that they embrace the faith. There are a lot of wicked men who go to church. One of the rules, anybody who knows anything about organized crime, and the Italian mafia in particular knows, that according to mafia rules, you had to go to Mass. If you were a made man, if you were part of the mafioso, you had to attend church. That was required. Every great organized criminal leader in our country was known to go to church. Al Capone was the churchgoer. Every great mafios figure has always gone to church. John Gotti was a churchgoer. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But this is where Paul said, we've got to be careful because too many people want to believe that just because they come to church that they're going to be saved. No, he said, the unrighteous have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's not about simply coming to church and all of a sudden you're saved because you come to church. He said, no, there is a distinction between those who will be saved and those who will not. I want to point out because so many in the LGBT community find themselves condemned when they read the word effeminate in the King James translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to help you understand something real quick because this is an area where so many misunderstand and they wind up experiencing great uh, difficulty because of this word that we read in the King James text. <coughs> the word that is translated effeminate in the King James <coughs> excuse me, comes from the original Greek, a word which simply translates as soft. So literally, the literal translation of this word would be soft. The problem is the translators of the King James interpreted the concept of one's being soft as being effeminate. Now, I have preached for decades that it is imperative when we study the Word of God that we understand Scripture answers Scripture. You do not simply use your own logic and your own reasoning to determine what this means over here. You know, you don't just apply human reasoning and expect to come up with divine understanding. It doesn't work that way. The truth of the matter is the term soft, as we read it in this passage, is the same word soft that we read when it is speaking of the rich and the well-to-do. Jesus said, when you go out to see John the Baptist, what are you going out to see? A man in soft raiment? He said, no, 
You're going to, you know, here's the guy who wears camel's hair. Here's the guy who's wearing anything but soft raiment. You see, the truth of the matter is, the term soft here, in my estimation, has more to do with the rich, those who live soft, easy lives. Did not Jesus say it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Yes, he did. So that would actually make sense, wouldn't it? But then also there are others who have pointed out that the term soft, as Paul used it, could easily have been speaking as well of those who were weak, those who could not hold their faith strong in the face of a great persecution and great difficulty. Because in the first century, the church experienced a great deal of persecution. And many people proved themselves to be soft. They couldn't stand up to the persecution. They couldn't stand up to uh, the ridicule. And therefore, they would surrender and yield their faith. So no matter how you look at it, the truth of the matter is, this passage could well be speaking of those who are uh, soft. They can't stand up to the trials and tribulations of living for the Lord. It also can speak to those who are rich and well-to-do, whom the Bible has told us will have a harder time getting into the kingdom of heaven than a camel getting through the eye of an eagle. That makes sense, doesn't it? Amen. You see, we've got to be careful, folks. I just preached the other day. It's not as easy as black and white. You've got to do a little research. You've got to study to show yourself approved unto God. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9-11 to of unregenerate sinners joining themselves to the body of Christ without being in possession of true faith in the resurrected Lord. We've had politicians in the last five years running around trying to identify themselves as part of the church and yet they are as ungodly and as wicked in lifestyle and it is a well-known fact they are. They're on their third marriages. they got babies with women all over the place. They have been involved with prostitutes while their wife was married and while their wife was pregnant. And yet somehow we have Christian leaders who have the gall to get up and tell God's people, yes, this man is a Christian. Yes, this man a follower of Christ. It doesn't matter that everything in his life testifies to this not being true. Oh, don't be deceived, children. Don't be deceived because if you can believe Donald Trump's a Christian, then you can believe you can be a Christian and do all the same things he does. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Do not be deceived, my friend. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, the author writes, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, meaning to government and authorities, to obey magistrates, that means law enforcement, to abide by the law, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, Oh, what? So it isn't within the Christian purview to claim that Democrats are sacrificing children to the devil in the basement of pizza parlor somewhere. I'm sorry, that's not the way my Bible reads. My Bible said to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, meaning not to be argumentative and debative, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, meaning desires and pleasures, 
living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration, baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, baptism with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Acts 2.38, my friend, is being mirrored in this passage. Which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't it funny that in the same passage, Titus says God our Savior and Jesus Christ our Savior in the same identical passage. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Oh, children, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. We're getting closer to the end of this age. And the enemy is pulling out all the stops to deceive as many of God's people as he possibly can. And you know what? It's working. We're not seeing the move of God in Pentecostal churches like we did just even 30 years ago, 40 years ago, never mind 100 years ago. We're not seeing the move of God. We're not seeing things happen in spirit-filled churches like we used to see. Why? Because the enemy has got the church distracted. He's got the church fighting culture wars. He's got the church fighting political wars. Instead of being focused on spiritual things and living as the Word of God has called us to live, being the testimony and the witness before a lost and dying world that God has called us to be. Don't be deceived if you live like the world, if you've got as much hate in you and anger in you and malice in you as they do, then folks, you're going to experience the same end they experience. Mm -hmm. Don't deceive yourself. Don't kid yourself. The church today looks more like the world than the church has ever looked. Cracks me up when I see these idiot politicians getting on television or on the radio and saying, Oh, the church is supposed to inform the government how to do things, not vice versa. Baloney. The church is not supposed to be married to the government in any way, shape, size, or form. The church's mission is spiritual. The government's mission is natural and carnal. It is not the church's business to dominate or control any organization or structure in this life. And saying so is deception. You are fooling the people of God. And the thing that makes me laugh is, where is the distinction between the church and the world? Mm -hmm. I don't see it. The church is as angry. Why are so many people following after politicians like Donald J. Trump? Oh, because he expresses the anger that we feel. He's angry and he expresses our anger. Oh, really? So what you're telling me then is the church is as angry as the world is. Hello now. The church is as hateful as the world is. The church is as spiteful as the world is. The church is looking for... Revenge just as quickly as the world is looking for revenge, if I tell the truth. Lastly, today in Romans 2, 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. 
For thou that judgest, listen, doest the same things. It's always amazed me how a secular homophobia looks absolutely no different than religious homophobia. No, homophobia is homophobia. It don't matter whether it's in the church or out of the church. It looks the same in either place. The only difference is the church tries to quote scripture to justify it. But they use all the same arguments. But listen, Paul said in Romans chapter 2, he said, you're, while you're judging somebody else, he said, all you're doing is bringing condemnation down on yourself because you're doing the same identical things they're doing. You accuse them of being hateful, you're being hateful. You accuse them of being malicious, and you're being malicious. You, can, you accuse them of trying to control the world, and you're trying to control the world. And I tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing Seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've been doing affirming ministry now for 30 years. I'm literally a few months away from celebrating 30 years of ministry, trying to reach out with a restorative mess message to all people who have lost uh, faith in the church and who have been separated and ostracized from the church but especially those who are part of the LGBT community who have been pushed aside and, and mistreated and abused. And believe me, I've been there, so I know what I'm talking about. I know this goes on. But I've been 30 years now trying to minister a message of restoration and reconciliation and healing to people who feel as though the church has failed them, who feel as though God's people have failed them. And they have. But I'm here to tell you now, folks, we cannot afford to be deceived. You can't afford to lose out on eternal life and the blessing of God and the favor of God on your life in the here and now, all because people who aren't going to make heaven anyway, people who, who God does not see as being part of His family, people who act one way and profess something different, you, you don't understand, according to the Word of God, the authors of the New Testament epistles have made it clear that 
Just because you come into the church doesn't mean you're what part of the church. You know, I've said before and I'll say it again, I get so tired of people telling me I can be a Christian and I don't have to go to church. You know what? I'd go find me a little church somewhere that had ten people in it that I could worship with, that I could benefit from the preached Word of God with. If, if I had to search every church in town, I'd find me one that I could fellowship with. Because we need one another, especially the Word of God said, as we see the day approaching. Children, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. When you see people out there sowing malice and angst and anger, when you see them sowing all these negative things, you better know that they're not going to somehow prove God a liar. They're not somehow going to reap good from all that bad seed. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But the truth is, the same laws that apply to them apply to you and I. You know, Tommy, I've been preaching this message for 30 years and I feel more confident in the message you hear preached from this church than I do the message I hear preached from 90% of television preachers. I don't get up here and preach against this group and that group. I don't get up here and preach against those people and those people. No, in this church we instruct people to live good, don't we? Mm -hmm. To do good. Mm -hmm. We talk about good works and good deeds being the earmark of living for God. We talk about righteousness and doing right. And at the very least striving to do right, don't we? Mm -hmm. You don't hear that preached anymore from church pulpits. You don't hear preachers preaching God's people into right living. You don't hear preachers preaching God's people into doing good. You don't hear preachers preaching love your neighbor, love your enemy, do good to them that spitefully use you. That very passage that I read today, I have read probably in the last six months, I've read that passage at least five or six times in the course of my message, haven't I? Mm -hmm. When's the last time you heard that passage preached? By Franklin Graham. When's the last time you heard that passage preached? By Pat Robertson. When's the last time you heard that passage preached? By all these television preachers who brag that they're doing the will and work of God. No, 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 children. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Oh, I'm here to tell you, the enemy's pushing hard because blessing is coming our way. The enemy wants to... You know, I, I'm going to close with this. I was, trying, I was trying not to, to be honest with you, but I'm going to close with it because it's a good example. We have neighbors. Never in the history of my life have I ever not gotten along famously with my neighbors. I've always gotten along very well with my neighbors for the most part. I, I've never had trouble with neighbors. If they need help, I'm there to help them. If, if they need something, I'm happy to lend it to them. Or if they need their, their lawn mowed, I'm happy to mow it for them. We had one little neighbor across the street from us here. He since has passed on, bless his heart. He was a little old Baptist man. And he, his lawn would grow up real tall and everything because he couldn't get out and mow it. And I, I guess he couldn't afford to hire anybody to mow it either. So when I would go out to mow our lawn, I would use, I used a riding tractor mower, you know. And after I was done with our lawn, I'd go down the road a little bit, go down and come up the other side because that's the only way I could go down off the sidewalk, you know. I'd come up the other side, I'd mow his front lawn for him. And uh, he was so grateful and he was so pleased that he told me, he said, you know, he said, you are 
living Christianity the way Christianity is supposed to be lived. That's what he told me one time. And he said, and I'm so grateful, he said, I can't even tell you how grateful I am. And you know, I didn't mind doing it for him, did I, Booby? No. Nope. One time, we hadn't lived here very long, I noticed that my neighbor next door, their lawn was kind of high. And here in Texas, in Dallas especially, we have these people that drive around code enforcement, and they'll give you a ticket if your lawn is high and stuff, you know. So, like a fool, I decided I was going to try to be nice to my neighbor, and I mowed my lawn, and then I went ahead and mowed their front lawn for them, too. Now, I did it not as an insult to them. I wasn't trying to say, y'all don't take care of your lawn, so I'll take care of it for you. No, I did it thinking I knew this was an older couple, and I told Tommy, I said, normally the old man's out there mowing his lawn regularly and everything. I said, maybe he's sick or something, so I'm going to do it as a way of trying to help them a little bit, you know? Well, we hadn't lived here very, very long. I mean, maybe a month or two when I did that. And next thing you know, every time... I see one of those people, the neighbors, the couple, the man or the woman, every time I see one of them starting to walk over toward me, I'd be mowing the lawn and one of them start coming toward me on my tractor. And they'd walk right into our property, you know, and come to me on my tractor. And I knew, after a while I learned that the minute I saw them coming to me, they were going to start griping and groaning and throwing a hissy fit over something. Because this is what they proved to do. Every single time, without exception. They never came over to just shoot the breeze, you know. That old fella that used to live kind of crossways from us across the street, bless his heart, he'd see me out there morning and he'd come over and he'd start talking to me. But he'd be talking about the weather and talking about this and that. And, and I couldn't get my lawn mowed because he was a talker. He'd just talk and talk and talk. But he didn't come over to complain. He'd just come over to shoot the breeze, you know. Well, these people, they don't shoot the breeze. The only, only reason they ever, ever walked over in my direction was to complain about something. And they would complain about the most foolish, idiotic stuff you ever heard in your life. The old lady, well, you mowed three inches into our property line. The property line is right here. Do you see this crack between these sidewalk panels here? Well, that's the property line right there. So I would try my best to mow up to that line. Well, of course, folks, I don't care how perfect you are, you're never going to be able to do exactly, you know, on a certain line. And she'd come griping because I went one inch over her. Literally, this is how ridiculous it got. I spent thousands of dollars, literally, putting in flower beds that were no maintenance on the side of the house facing their property, right along the front of the house, Right along their property line, I put a flower bed, went all the way down to the road almost. And that way, I never have to worry about whether or not I mow up to their property line. Do you know those people will mow within an inch of that border that I put for this flower bed? And then they'll sit there and wait for us to come trim the other inch on the other side facing their property. This is how ridiculous they are about the property line. And yet this last week they were cutting branches overhanging their carport that belongs to a tree in our yard that is right up against the fence. Now by law if a tree is overhanging your property you by law can trim those branches. I don't have a problem with them trimming the branches. Couldn't care less. But then they have the gall to bring all the trimmings that they've trimmed and lay them out in front of our house for the big trash collector people to come collect. Now why would they do this? 
if they put them in front of their house, they're going to get picked up just as quick as they're going to get picked up if they're in front of our house. The only problem is Tommy and I, at the moment, park our cars out in front of the house on the road. So with all them tree branches, there, we have to move our cars way up forward so the trash people can reach these limbs to pick them up and stuff. Here are people who are so worried about the property line that they want to gri gripe and groan every chance they get, but they don't think nothing of intruding upon that property line when it suits them. They don't think they don't think anything of letting their dog wander the neighborhood and come over into our yard and poop. Our dogs go in the backyard. They never go in the front yard. If we take our dogs out the front door, they are on a leash, which is the law here in Texas. They okay, Pastor, why are you saying all this? I'm trying to paint a picture for you. I'm trying to help you understand something. I got so aggravated with these people this week because Tommy went out to the car and we had taken the branches they left and we moved them over to their side of the property line. And that was so that we could park our cars where we park our cars without having to, you know, park halfway into the next state. <laughs> And, you know, so, the, so that the people can pick them up. Well, I was in the backyard, Tommy is in the front yard, and this old lady comes to Tommy and she starts griping and groaning about how, well, those are branches from our tree, from your tree, and that's why we're going to put them over there. And then she had the gall to tell Tommy the real reason they were pulling this little stunt. If you have too much big trash... The city of Dallas will charge you for collecting that trash that they pick up. So she said to Tommy, and you're going to get a bill for all them uh, tree branches and brush and blah, blah, blah. Because it was your tree that we cut it down. Well, I don't know what she thinks I'm going to do. Whether I'm going to cut the tree down from my yard just to make her happy. Or whether I have magic powers and somehow or another I can say tree, poof do not grow any longer over into their side of, you know, of uh, the property line. I don't know what things I can do. Well, I got quite aggravated with her foolishness. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and the Spirit of the Lord said, Be careful. Be careful. The enemy uses these kind of circumstances so he can push you off track so you'll do something stupid. So you'll do something you shouldn't have done. And then you no longer are lined up for a blessing. So be careful. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And the Lord reminded me of this, Tommy. And I said, okay, Lord, I get it. So I've got to, I've got to measure my response. I've got to be careful not to overreact. Not to get foolish about this. Do you follow what I'm telling you, saints? I'm going to tell you, folks, don't be deceived. God wants His people to act like His people regardless of what's going on in our world, regardless of what's going on in our culture, regardless of what's going on in our government. Am I telling the truth today? Be not deceived. Amen.